Um, our last uh, presenter this, um, uh, in our symposium today is uh, my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Thomas Wisner. He's professor of anthropology, and um, I actually uh, got my PhD here at an in anthropology at UCLA, I'm proud to say, and um, uh, Tom was uh, one of my mentors, um, if not directly, uh, informally, since I've been in the program, and I'm very um, excited and pleased that we've been able to become colleagues. And um, um, I was chatting with Tom uh, about a week ago at one of Tom Coates' events in the Center for World Health and didn't even realize, much like Reza was saying, he wasn't aware of Federico's work overseas. I didn't realize that aside from the incredible work that I knew Tom has done, um, in his anthropological research. He's been a board member of, of one of the most important um, NGOs working on child children's issues, Child Fund International. Um, uh, Tom has been a fellow for the Advanced Studies in Behavioral Sciences, a uh, member of the MacArthur Foundation, and his work on families, both poor families, as well as families' uh, daily activities, responsibilities, and obligations has really made a significant impact in our understanding of the way families um, uh, uh, are organized and, and in with regards to child development, both in African countries and in the United States. So it's my supreme honor and pleasure that uh, you are here today, uh, Tom, to talk with us about your work um, as an anthropologist uh, in conjunction with your work at, uh, in, with NGOs, in particular Child Fund International, and um, uh, to uh, perhaps tell us some stories from the anthropological perspective to complement these physician stories. So uh, thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. And, uh, to the other organizers of this presentation. I, I can tell you that, um, at least from my personal point of view, I'm inspired by these presentations. I mean, Dan Levy and Federico, uh, Nick Kutris and Reza, I mean, the, all, all four of these programs are tremendous. One of the uh, things that Bonnie has suggested we uh, talk about in the symposium is the, is the anthropological perspective on these kinds of programs. And, as far as, I can, as far as I'm concerned, you just heard it. Most of the perspectives that I think are the positive contributions of anthropology and other social sciences to these issues, you just heard them exemplified. So um, just um, fill in these four case studies and you have examples of what uh, can and should be done, in my view. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the anthropology perspective. And in particular, the generally, the role of non-governmental organizations, these are examples of different kinds, and larger and smaller ones, in um, bringing well-being to families and children around the world. Uh, I'll talk about the range of such programs and at least give an example from one I'm more familiar with, which is Child Fund. I'll talk about the perspective of anthropology with regard to NGOs and how they do their work. And, um, what is known about uh, more or less effective ways that they can do their work. And as I just said, you just heard about effective ways to do such work. I'll give examples from an organization that I work with, uh, and I'm on the board of Child Fund International, and also the Child Fund Alliance, which is 11 different donor countries that provide services to kids around the world and are in a consortium. And finally, I'll mention something that uh, doesn't really need to be said about the medically oriented uh, uh, programs you just heard about, which is, do they work? Are they effective? Are they cost effective? Compared to other programs, how should we assess them? But in these cases, we know they're effective when you've healed a child of a heart condition or you've, you've helped kids with diabetes and so forth. But there is a broader question, which is how can we improve or do continuous improvement of programs. I'll talk a little bit on the research side about how we should think about how to uh, uh, evaluate and make them more effective. And um, because uh, this presentation is, I think, between you and lunch, I'm going to try to keep it short. So I'm going to move through the, the uh, slides as fast as I can and uh, leave some time for questions. If you have a question along the way, just raise your hand and I'll try to catch it. So uh, we're also, I'm also uh, very happy to have, oh, 
Mr. Jaramillo is here. Has he left from Ecuador? Well, um, I had the opportunity to visit child fund programs in Ecuador, and as a result, I'm featuring some of the Ecuadorian programs, uh, which I'm going to come back to uh, after talking about some international ones. And uh, one of the things that Ecuador uh, does is um, provide the flowers for uh, much of Southern California. They have a huge flower export industry. And uh, Child Fund does microcredit. Um, these are youth and child programs in Ecuador. And uh, here's again a flower program that was uh, sponsored by Child Fund in a uh, region of Ecuador. And I'm going to come back to that toward the end of the presentation. Um, but first, I'm going to give you a little overview of uh, child and family focused NGOs around the world. And uh, uh, my first point is this is a very large industry. There's a market for such programs and services and the scale of some of them. And these are ones that are, if not exclusively, primarily focused on families and children is uh, big. The largest one is Caritas International, which is the Catholic charity uh, around the world. It's listed on this chart as uh, 4.4 billion euros in uh, revenue per year. And this was in 2008. These are much higher now. As you go down the list, the ones in yellow are ones that are specifically focused on children and family support programs. Uh, the second is the um, uh, uh, evangelical program, World Vision. I think many of you are familiar with these programs. They're listed there at 2.2 billion euros. They're also much higher. Down there at number 12 is the Child Fund Alliance which is the group that I'm on the board of. And they're at a paltry 514 million euros in 2011. So the point I want to make is that um, in addition to the kinds of programs that you just heard about today, there, there, is a, there is a global effort to provide programs and services in this example. Uh, for uh, children and families, including health, but including other kinds of things as well. And so those are the top 31 as of a few years ago. And uh, the combined total, at least uh, in that study, was uh, around 18 billion euros, and that is an underestimate. If you're a student and you're interested in working in this world, in this industry, there is an industry out there, not only programs such as you've heard of, but others that you could work in and participate in if you want to. So let me talk about Child Fund specifically. It's a, a, a model for producing revenue and for providing services is that individuals in uh, donor countries sponsor a child. I'm sure you've seen advertisements in the TV and newspapers and magazines. They also have special programs. For example, they might have a special program for encouraging uh, women's health centers, and they get contributions and donations for that. They might have major donors who will give very large sums of money for specific interests. And we just heard an example of that which re with regard to eye care. And then you have grants and collaborative agreements that NGOs make with governments. So when um, USAID or PEPFAR, which is an uh, HIV AIDS organization, says they're going to give $20 billion a year to promote uh, uh, treatment and services for HIV. PEPFAR doesn't do that. They contract with NGOs or other governmental organizations. They do it. They're the ones that are on the ground, delivering the food, providing the services, working in villages, and so forth. So Child Fund, for example, directly sponsors or enrolls about 450,000 kids. Uh, Child Fund has a budget of $250 million per year total from the United States, from all sources. We have 1,500 volunteers around the world, and there are 11 other countries. The model uh, of Child Fund long term is to turn recipient countries into donor countries. So there are several of them. Thailand, Mexico, Brazil, they're now donor countries. They raise funding for their own country and for other countries, say, in South America. So the long-term goal is to bring more and more countries that we're working with to become donor countries. <coughs> the program model for a lot of NGOs, and you heard examples of that all morning, 
You have to have a local community sponsor in a community, in a county, in a village. They want a women's health center. They want early child uh, uh, programs. They want, uh, they have a, a, a HIV, uh, and they want treatment and services for HIV. That community has to have enough of an interest in organization to ask for and describe and define the kind of program they want. Then the government has to at least agree or provide additional resources or support. And then Child Fund gets sponsors for the children and for the community programs. So there are three components. You have to have local buy-in, government, and Child Fund. Also, the Child Fund model is long-term. All of these examples that we just heard, they're, they're in, in the Colombian case, they're there for decades. They build programs. You can come in and do a service once and, and, and uh, improve something, but if you can stay for a decade, you can bring a child from preschool through adolescence. So there's an early childhood to adolescence emphasis in child fund programs. And different countries and communities have different local conditions. They need different kinds of programs. So child fund uh, offers a variety of programs. Some other NGOs offer a single thing. They build housing, they provide livestock, they do a particular kind of health care, and that's also valuable. But the NGO model here is we want to support the whole child and family through childhood. Most NGOs have kind of a core message, and this is Child Fund's message. If you go on the website of most NGOs, you'll see something like that. You even saw a few examples from the other uh, programs you saw this morning. Do you believe that the well-being of children leads to, can lead to the well-being of the world? If you can focus on children that are deprived, excluded, or vulnerable for a variety of reasons to thrive, you can change a community and the world. So that's, that's the aspirational model of Child Fund and a lot of NGOs. To turn that into an actual measurable program for kids, you, ha you, you have to be specific and you have to take the child through um, to zero, zero to five up through adolescence at least. <clears throat> so there are three specific program goals that an NGO like Child Fund aspires to. Healthy and secure infants and young children, which is measured by uh, weight, height, health care, and by whether they have a, non a stable child care environment during the first years of life. Educated and confident, ha can they and have they finished primary school? Are they competent at reading? And are, do they feel efficacious or engaged in their, the activities of their community? And then youth that are involved and skilled. Can they find a job or some other work? Do they have, feel belonging to some community that matters to them and their, and their uh, natal family? Can they form a family of their own with some stability? And finally, are those families networked in their community and in their region? So this is, again, a more specific set of goals that you can assess or try to. What's the role of anthropology in all this? Well, as I said, you, I, I saw the, the aspirational role of anthropology enacted in these other talks we heard this morning. First of all, the cultural and ecological context has to be bracketed in, not out. So all these programs you heard this morning, they say, well, what, what's the community like? What, how can people access services? What are the resources available? What are they, how do they think about the program that we are hoping to offer. What is at stake for people? What is the experience, intentions, and meaning systems that the community is bringing, which then can be used as a part of the program, or at least you have to know deeply in order to have an effective, sustainable program. Finally, what organizes people's daily lives? What's their daily routine like? What are the activities that they need to or want to do every day, and how can you fit your program into it? Finally, do you use qualitative ethnographic field work as part of your research and practice? All of these examples that we heard today are doing that naturally because you have to do it to have an enduring, sustainable program. Finally, communities are diverse and heterogeneous. On the one hand, you don't want to, quote, stereotype them. On the other hand, there are conflicts and consensus both in a community. You need to find the areas of consensus or deal with the areas where there is conflict. The goal of anthropology, at least this aspiration is, it goes from the very local 
local meaning and family group, like you saw Bonnie talking to this family, to the global issues of improving well-being and back again. In anthropology and other social sciences, there's this paradoxical criticism of programs like these and also participation by anthropologists in such programs at the same time. Bonnie mentioned earlier this morning that anthropology has been participating in international programs for a long time, but if you open an anthropology journal, you'll find criticism of these same programs in those journals at the same time. No intervention, such as the ones we've heard about today, or interventions for kids, no matter how good they may be, if they can't find a place in that community in the daily routine of life of families, or a hospital, or a clinic, or a school, or classroom, it won't survive, no matter how good it is. You have to know what these local conditions and uh, systems are in order to sustain your program. Also, if you want to continually improve it, you need to know those kinds of things. And you have to have qualitative evidence and buy-in from the community as well as uh, knowing what works in a biomedical or human development perspective. So again, anthropology is at the three-foot level, like what Bonnie was doing hanging around with those families. But it's, it's less likely to be that knowledgeable actually at the 30,000-foot level, such as what Tom Coates was talking about this morning sort of a global plan to provide health care for all. That's a great goal, an aspirational goal. But I think the anthropology contribution is more. So some of the places we just saw in these slides, how would you do that? What would these people think? What do they know about insurance? There are critiques of NGOs by anthropologists and others in the social sciences. And I'm going to mention some. And then I'm going to show some examples of child fund programs, in addition to all the great programs you just heard about. And we'll come back at the end to how valid these critiques are. But I think, for, especially for students and, and, and those of us who are running such programs or involved in them, you know, we're, we're aware of these kind of critiques. First of all, they create dependency or they perpetuate dependency. Uh, none of the examples you heard this morning are doing that because they all have local partners that are building local programs. But there are NGOs that come in, do something, and go away. And then they come back later, and, they, and all the funding comes from outside. None of it comes from inside. In the human development and family field, first world ideas are forced onto local communities, or that's the critique. Oh, you want kids to learn to read? Well, we want kids to work hard in our farm. We, you, you want kids to have a voice in how the school is run. We don't want kids to have a voice <laughs> in how our schools are run. Um, NGOs are critiqued for being ineffective. They say they're going to change poverty or increase education, and then they, maybe they don't. Or they're inefficient. You give a dollar, and people commonly say, well, most of the dollars go to a bloated bureaucracy, and they don't really go enough of it to provide the services. Another criticism is that it reduces the citizen pressure on government. Well, if Child Fund provides early childhood education or provides women's health centers, why should the government provide them? So it, it disconnects government demands from national programs. Another critique is from market uh, theorists who say that NGOs are in part outside the market economy, um, although as I just alluded to, they're actually deeply in the market economy because they have to raise every dime that's spent and they have to do it effectively. But the, the general argument is the market should provide a solution to poverty and health issues, not these do-good NGOs. There's also the flies in the eyes, shame and blame, which is when you see ads for NGOs, they often show sad, impoverished families and children, and there's sad music playing, and they want you to give money to them, and many people find this insulting. Um, Child Fund has stopped running those kinds of ads. I think they used to years ago. They run other kinds of ads. There's also shame and blame. Under, for, there's a lot of uh, NGOs that do advocacy work, um, and the advocacy consists of going into communities and government and saying, you, the government, or you, these agencies are bad, you're not doing anything, you're not providing any services, shame on you. Then you leave. And uh, you, you leave the country in a situation actually worse than they were before. Also, local programs are critiqued because, well, these are global problems. 
Inequality is a global issue. Why are you focusing on some villages or some communities in, uh, in uh, one region or one country? There's also more um, harsh critiques, which is that uh, NGOs, in order to raise money, find impoverished families and kids and sell them to donors. Or local actors in countries find out what NGOs need and they sell their <laughs> communities to the donors. And there are other critiques. So I'm raising this, these not because actually I believe most of these are true, I believe most of these are not true, and it's a kind of critique-driven social science that is unproductive, but because these critiques are out there, and they are believed, and they sometimes can undermine very good work that people are doing. So let's look at child fund. How is child fund doing? Uh, let me mention two ways to think about this. Are you organ are, is the organization, the NGO itself, including the ones you heard about today, are they respected, high quality uh, places to be and to work? Uh, what are their practices in their own, with their own staff and their own volunteers? Um, uh, do the sponsors and children feel involved? Are other funders coming to them to offer them support? Do the parents, communities, and governments have a high regard for them? Do they work with other NGOs or do they just keep to themselves? The sign of an effective good NGO is that they would be positive on these kinds of measures. So would a government program or any kind of program. If they're not, then I think this is a cause for concern. Um, Tom Coates mentioned the uh, Lancet report on global health. Um, Horton, who was, who was the editor of Lancet, listed six features of institutions that would be necessary in countries and communities in order for this global 30,000 foot health initiative to even happen. And those are the six. A good NGO has five of the six. They don't have a judiciary, a parliament, and a, and a national uh, government. But they have the other five. They have an information system about how they're doing. They have good financial management. They have leadership and management that, that keeps the organization on track. They have quality standards, and they have accountability from outside people. Now, if you have an NGO that has these things, absent the, the uh, government part, uh, it, it, it's a, probably a pretty high quality organization. And for these global health initiatives to have a chance, these things have to exist. Then you have the research side, which is how do you assess whether any program, an NGO program or otherwise, is even working? And I'm mentioning four things here. First of all, they're indices, which are these global health indicators. You saw a few of them this morning, but this is um, mortality goes up or goes down. Uh, the NGO actually may have little or nothing to do with this on the big scale, but this is a kind of indi indicator that's frequently used. Outputs are, we, we uh, Child Fund built more preschools this year than last year. We have more communities in our health centers this year than last year. So it's a, that's just an output. It's not an outcome. An outcome is how many kids have a sufficient literacy level who have been in our programs compared to kids who are not in our programs. And an impact is a random assignment experimental trial where you compare child fund programs or kids to others in, co in comparable communities who are not in child fund but who could have been. And you ask how much difference did child fund make compared to uh, a control or comparison sample. There's also relative opportunity costs. What if we stopped spending money on early childhood and spent money on youth? Would that be better? Or you could ask, is World Vision doing better than Child Fund? No NGO is doing research on that question, to my knowledge, <laughs> today. It's, not, it's something that we would like to know, actually, but I'm not aware of any organization that is actually saying, well, let's get all of the, all the, uh, all the programs that are involved in surgical intervention, and let's see who's most cost effective and has the best outcomes, and then we'll give more money to the ones that are more cost effective. But there should be. Child Fund operates in Ecuador. I had the opportunity to visit those programs in Ecuador. And here are a whole range of youth programs. Youth safety, youth um, uh, use of computers, um, media. There's a whole media program that the Child Fund operates in Ecuador. 
Um, in Indonesia, early childhood programs, there are 26,000 kids that are in child fund sponsored early childhood programs in Indonesia alone. Um, and they fit the components that you saw earlier, uh, height and weight. There's the boy on the right who's posing for me while he's getting his height and weight. Uh, they have uh, meals served at the centers and they have community participation in these centers. Here's a uh, grammar school, primary school that we sponsor uh, in a Muslim community in, uh, in uh, Indonesia, in uh, Java. So, so you have the girls and the boys in the school. They receive um, a curriculum enhancement, tuition, um, teacher training programs, and other programs. The preschool programs are connected to the uh, primary school programs as much as possible. So if you go to the preschool, you're already actually connected to the primary school. This increases engagement. Another approach of NGOs in the family and child field is that there's already something existing which is pretty good, but it has problems It could be better. So for a relative value added, you could really improve an existing thing that the community wants. On the upper left is a water tower. There was a health center in rural Kenya that I went and visited. The water system failed. They had no, they had no water or electrical services to run the thing. Child Fund provided a new water system to an existing program with staff that was, that was doing good work. Uh, on the upper right are uh, teachers' houses built in a very isolated rural school. Teachers won't come to those schools and teach that, have been, that, that are well-trained and are the higher quality teachers because the, the environment is, is not adequate. They don't like it. So they built the houses. The funny thing about that slide is that these furniture you see there, the teacher had furniture that he wanted to put into the building, but it didn't fit. So they won't go through the door. <laughs> So, so they were going to cut the couch in half, get it through the door. On the lower uh, left is another water program where you had a high school that had, uh, that had a lab and other services for kids that had to board at the high school because it was so isolated, but there was no water. On the lower right, it's hard to spot me in that picture, but I'm slightly taller than some of the kids there. Um, they had a preschool that um, didn't have a way to transition into elementary school. So we provided a program for the kids and the teachers to do that. One of the problems with a lot of rural development programs, it's not often discussed, is trust. The money is absconded with, the, <laughs> the resources don't get to where they're supposed to get. So I put this slide in because on the upper level, you see this little box with three locks? So three women in the rural um, co-op that Child Fund invested in with credit, livestock, and health care. It took three women to open those three locks, to open the box, to take any money in or out. And they could only do it at a program. On the lower right, you see the box and our visit to them. And uh, these women are, are uh, no fools. All us visitors had to uh, invest in the bank, so we had to put in 20 bucks or something into the box before we could hear the program. <laughs> Another thing about NGOs and, uh, that's, that you see all over the place, including um, efforts at advocacy, is the, you make the values very visible. So here's a program in Ethiopia, which is both preschool and elementary school, and look at the sign. You see this all over. Children should be seen and heard. Now, th this, this is not a universally desired uh, <laughs> feature of... Uh, rural African traditional life, nor actually is it in the United States. But, but the child fund programs put these up. Here's another one in a hospital. This is, this is a billboard, not just a sign, a huge billboard at a hospital in uh, Addis Ababa showing the principles of ethical service because frankly medical service in a lot of communities, certainly in sub-Saharan Africa, are uh, not ethically provided. You have to pay, you have to pay under the table. Um, service is very selective, the people hoard resources. So they put this up there and then they try to run the program on these principles as much as they can. Here's another one for preschool programs. I like this, Myths About Early Childhood. This is a program in Kenya. It's too luxurious, there's no approach, it just means kindergarten, it's just custodial. So they have a list of all these things and then they go through and they try to explain that no, this is 
something that you might want to try. Uh, on the left are universal values that the community adopted and then the, the program for teacher development and the preschool programs try to encourage. Um, where there's no water, you try to provide water. So you have hand washing and you have potable water to drink. And they're put in big containers with bright colors and the kids see them. And when you have, uh, when you have lunch programs or other water programs, you make it very visible. You paint it on the side of the school. Here's an HIV program in Zambia. Um, they constructed board games. Some of you may be familiar with board games to teach kids about uh, uh, transmission of HIV and what it is and how to deal with it and what if you have it and so on. So there you see the board games and you see all the posters that they made. Um, the scale of many of these programs is small. The picture on the upper left is the HIV program office. That's it. It's a room in a small uh, center by a school with maybe three buildings like that. But the, but the impact can be very, very large. Uh, it can be larger than even hospital-based programs. On the top of this slide is a um, uh, blood testing machine at a hospital in Addis Ababa, one of only a very few in the entire city. And on the right is a book in which you by hand write down the name of the person and the ID number and the results of their test. On the lower right is the entire social service agency office for that hospital, which is the second largest hospital in Addis Ababa. On the lower left is where one of the patients lives that we went and visited. There is no connection between on the upper left and the lower left. That is, there's no connection between the service providing the diagnosis and treatment and the social services you're trying to deliver to people. This is where the people live who are uh, child funds um, clients and participants. They live in very poor urban uh, neighborhoods and environments, usually one room, maybe two, in these kinds of huts. How can you provide services to thousands? It's a 7 percent of the residents of Addis Ababa uh, have HIV AIDS. Whoops. One way to provide those kinds of services is that you hire youth who live in these communities to be outreach workers. The goal is to keep the child in a household that's viable and functioning and has food and the kids can go to school and their parent or caregiver can be kept alive as well. We have 300 youth that have been hired and trained to do that kind of work. So the model is you use the local resources to provide the services. Here's another example of an HIV program. Orphans, you know, the orphans and vulnerable children, most African kids are not really orphans. That is, they don't have nobody. They have a network of kin and care. You just need to identify who those people are and support them. So here's a program in rural Kenya where you find the caregivers who are responsible for all those kids you see in the picture, many of whom have HIV AIDS or have had parents who have died or have kin who have HIV. You, you mix those kids with the general population. It's very it's, it's very problematic to separate the kids that have HIV AIDS from the others and then you can effectively build programs for them. Ecuador. So we have school programs in Ecuador. On the upper left is a little bank that you uh, that the kids can deposit money in each week and then they go on trips afterwards and the kids get a receipt and there's a computer that runs it gives them the receipt. The computer there's a computer center on the lower left and uh, the kids are involved in the school programs. Um, one of the things that kids complain about a great deal in, in many countries, including Ecuador, is they don't feel entirely safe in their own village. There's domestic violence, there's drugs and alcohol issues, there's the, well, one of the things kids are scared of are dogs that run around at night. This village made a map, which you see there, of every house and the, how dangerous it was and where the kids could safely go in the village. And on the right side, you see the little uh, map that they made for that village. And they go out and identify the dangerous areas and improve them. Water programs, microcredit, is another area where Child Fund operates. And it can help hundreds of families in a community. Oh, this is the bank again. But there's also a co-op bank that's for the whole community. And then you have the child's bank. Uh, this is the computer program. Uh, children's actively participate in the programs in Ecuador. 
um, to the extent feasible. Here's a flower co-op that was developed that uh, sends flowers probably to Trader Joe's, I don't know, or plenty of places. Um, these programs, if they have local support and they can visibly matter in kids' lives, one of the parents said, well, I found dignity by being in this program. Uh, dignity is quality plus love plus a heart. Doing this kind of work, uh, participating in an NGO like this, is not only very worthwhile and I think can add value to kids' lives, it is fun. And if you're a student and want to, how many students here have ever gone on a program somewhere, and even for the summer? You know, it's, it's uh, terrific. And uh, this is me in one of these ultralight uh, planes, and I'm a person who is scared of heights. I never should have done this. <laughs> Basically, these things are a motorcycle with a wing and a propeller in the back, and you get on the motorcycle, and that's the uh, Victoria Falls in Zambia, the, the border of Zambia and Zimbabwe below us there. And we're flying over it at about 1,500 feet. It was thrilling. It scared the hell out of me. And it was a lot of fun, and I encourage you to try to do the same. Thank you very much. <laughs>